Good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome to the World Pediatrics 2016 BVD Bovine Viral di Diarrhea Session. BVD is the only virus that gets its own sessions, the big and ugliest of all the viruses as regards cattle. Um, my name is Ronan O'Neill, I'm Head of Virology out in Back Weston, which is our central laboratory. It's a few miles out in the country from here. Uh, I'm going to guide just our, our speakers and you, the audience, through this session. Um, Okay, I have to do a bit of a Ryanair thing to kick off and uh, point out the, that the fact that you have to have your phones off before takeoff and that they're the exits, which is primarily the one at the back. I can't really see any others. Up here. Here we go. Up here we go. Okay. Um, I think that's all the, the niceties dealt with. Um, now, I'd like to introduce our, our, our first speaker. Um, it's, not very often, it's quite often that you chair these types of sessions, but it's not very often that you can hold the book up which the person you're speaking about is responsible for, and it's even, it's even less common that you have actually read that book. So, um, so I'd like to introduce Ju Julia Ridpath. She's come all the way from Iowa. Julia's a, a renowned scientist in the world of BVD, so um, I've, I've seen her speak at least twice, and she's, she's excellent. So very welcome, Julia. Thank you. I'll just like to thank the organizers for their wonderful opportunity to visit Dublin. It's, a, it's just been a, a real eye-opener, the loveliness of this city. Now, it's Wednesday morning. You've been through several days of meetings already, and I'm going to start out by talking about definitions. But before you start rolling your eyes, I'd like to share a sign. And I, I apologize for the quality of this. I took it through a bus window as we were driving around yesterday. And it reads, no hipsters. Don't be coming in here with your hairy faces, vegan diets, and your feet, and your tiny feet, and your sawdust bedding. No, wait, bad hamsters. No, I mean hamsters. Now, why do I start with that? Well, we have to define BVD. And if I say hamsters and you hear hipsters, we have a communication problem. And sometimes we have a communication problem, too, with defining what BVD is. So what's in the name? And we have multiple presentations under a tent that we call BVD. It's reproductive disease, it's enteric disease, it's respiratory disease, but mainly it's immune suppression, and that's everything else arises from that immune suppression problem. We have multiple hosts. Well, it's called bovine viral diarrhea virus. Most even told ungulates will contract it. And we have multiple virus species. We have BVD1, BVD2, and hobie like virus. Now, originally, we, you know, we all, from the time of Linnaeus, we're all about taxonomy because if we can define something, we can study it. And so, originally, we tried to define the genus within the pestivirus, uh, pestiviruses by host. And this was problematic because the viruses can infect multiple hosts, particularly border disease virus. But BVD in itself it infects a lot of different hosts. Designation to species based on clinical presentation, which was again problematic because, as we say, there's so many different clinical presentations that come under the BVD umbrella. Uh, designation to species based on antigenic factors was it worked, but they're not great enough. We can't really have serotypes as defined classically, and technically it's cumbersome. But fortunately, we could do phylogenetic analysis based on genetic comparisons, and we discovered that along with our original BVD1, we then had BVD2. And more recently now, we have emerging uh, putative species that's not late yet recognized by the taxonomic committee called Hobie-like virus. Now, the taxonomy wonks really don't like this because the name Hobie comes from Horst Schirmeyer and his technician, Ho and Bai, for Horst and Bridget. And there are a lot of people that would like to call Hobie-like virus BVD3. I'm kind of resisting that, and I can tell you why I'm being such an old bat about that one, is that if you've already eradicated BVD1 and BVD2 from your country and you're trying to say you're BVD-free, if you would have to go back then and say you don't have any Hobie-like virus either, and you can't say that based on the testing you do for BVD1 and BVD2. There's also a whole bunch of trade regulations, vaccine labels that would have to be changed. So 
Right now, I'm sticking with Hobie-like virus rather than atypical bovine pestivirus or uh, BVD3. So we have these three species. Uh, the first one reported was in 1946 in New York State, BVD1. Uh, BVD2 was around a lot longer. It's not a newly emerging virus, it's just a newly recognized. It was first recognized in 1987 based on phylogenetic analysis. And then the Hobie-like viruses were first isolated in 2004, but uh, from fetal bovine serum coming out of South America, but since then have been found in a number of other places in the world. So you can see that BVD1 is the most widespread globally. BVD2 nearly as, uh, as wide. It's missing the continent of Australia at this point in time. And Hobie-like virus seems to be more restricted at this point. But once again, a lot of our diagnostics will not recognize it. And a lot of what we were assuming in the past as BVD1 or 2 may actually be Hobie-like virus. A recent survey done in India where they assumed they were looking at BVD1 or 2 turned out to be Hobie-like virus, and that may even be the predominant BVD uh, species circulating in the subcontinent. So the disease syndromes under that BVD tent include immunosuppression, and I can't stress that enough, Regardless of what species you're looking at, they all are immunosuppressive. You can get respiratory disease frequently as the result of a secondary infection following uh, the bovine pestivirus that caused an immunosuppression. You get reproductive disease, including everything from lost pregnancies to aborted pregnancies to congenital defects. You can get persistent infection. And a follow-up to persistent infection is superinfection causing mucosal disease. And you also have hemorrhagic syndrome as the most severe expression of the clinical uh, spectrum um, under the BVD tent. Hemorrhagic syndrome uh, so far has just been reported and reproduced with the BVD2 strains. There do seem to be some high virulent BVD1 strain, but so far in, under experimental conditions, they haven't replicated the high virulence of the hemorrhagic syndrome. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen, it just doesn't, means we haven't been able to do it yet. Now, the other part of that unfortunate uh, moniker, bovine viral diarrhea, is that it doesn't just affect bovine and we shouldn't ever get the idea that it is, primary, it is only in bovine and that we only have to control it in bovine to get rid of the disease. It is found in a number of other species. And prominently, uh, wildlife species. Right now, we're still trying to figure out whether they act as a reservoir or they, are, they just are infected in con as they come in contact with uh, domestic species, but we don't really know that yet, and in any control program, they're going to have to be taken into consideration. Experimental infections, you can, uh, the BVD3 species seem to be able to go in most comers. And then found as contaminant in cell lines, this is mainly the result of contaminated fetal bovine serum being used in research facilities. Uh, so far, although Hobie-like viruses were first con uh, detected as a contaminant of fetal bovine serum, they haven't been reported as a contaminant of cell lines to this date. That doesn't mean they're not there, they just haven't been reported yet. So, variation among the bovine pestiviruses, as I say, there are three species. They differ genetically and antigenically. But also, each of the three species can exist as two biotypes, non-cytopathic and cytopathic. The non-cytopathic biotype predominates in nature. Most of what you're going to get out of the field outside of mucosal disease cases is going to be non-cytopathic. The non-cytopathic has the ability to establish persistent infection. And as I said before, they can range from low virulence to high virulence based on acute detection uh, as we've discussed over the years, it's, there's no such thing as an avirulent BVD because they all can cause reproductive problems and they can all ca cause immunosuppression. So we have uh, some strange dichotomy when we talk about low virulence BVD that's just an acute infection. Remember that there's no BVD that's your friend. Cytopathics are rare in nature. 
they are not able to establish persistent infections. They do cross the placenta, but at a much lower rate. I say that because I have isolated uh, vaccine strains on occasion out of fetuses. They are low virulence in that they don't cause the reproductive disease. They don't shed as well. They really are, seem to be a hampered virus. So they're considered naturally attenuated. Now, I said there's antigenic differences, and you can see this with uh, an acute infection, but what I'm showing you here are animals that gave birth to persistently infected animals, just so you can, it, because they have a higher titer, it's easier to see the differences between the titers against BBD1, BBD2, and Hobie-like virus. The other reason I've slapped this slide up is there was some, uh, a presentation yesterday uh, by Dr. Roth where he was talking about uh, serology and T cell response and saying you can't go by serology, uh, you can't establish um, uh, broad spectrum protection just based on serology. You have to have T cell and T cell may be more conserved. Well. What I would like to say about this slide, and I don't have a lot of time today, so I won't go into all the studies, but we took these animals that had given birth to persistently infected BVD1 and BVD2 uh, calves, and we bred them again and then challenged them with Hobie-like virus, and I was get, able to get Hobie-like virus to the fetus of all those uh, animals that had previously given birth to PIs. Those animals have both a T cell and a B cell response. Arguably, they have about as strong as you can get, stronger than you would get by vaccination because they've had such a long and strong exposure. So there are genuinely differences between these. I don't think anybody has done the experiment where they take animal uh, heifer that's given birth to a BVD1 PI and challenged it with a BVD2 to see how broad that uh, cross protection is. Anagenic relationships, once again, we say this is a slide that as a nearsighted man riding past on a fast horse. I don't want you to look at anything but the patterns. So we'll talk a little bit more now about subgenotypes. So you see there is some variation. This is a subgenotype 1A versus a 1B, a 2, and then be like These are monoclonal antibodies made against the uh, E2. They're neutralizing antibodies, so they're against neutralizing epitopes. But just showing you that with the monoclonals, we can easily show their differences too. But there are characteristics that all three of these share, and that they replicate in the immune tissue that's a natural home. Even though our isolation is primarily done in epithelial cells, all the bovine pestiviruses like to replicate in immune cells. This leads to damage of the immune cells and it leads to immunosuppression. They, it, they, they do replicate mainly in uh, B cells and T cells, neutrophils not so much, but they also immunosuppress neutrophils without uh, the necessarily replicating in them. They have the ability to cross the placenta and they're anagenically cross-reactive, although the cross-reactivity may not equate with cross-protection. And just as a side note here, I'm only talking about the bovine pestiviruses that we can isolate in culture. Right now, in the last year, they've discovered an atypical porcine pestivirus that was discovered with next-gen sequencing. It was not culturable, and it, we, even though we know it's there now, it's still problematic to culture. Ed DeBovey out of Cornell has been telling me for years that there's a non-culturable uh, bovine pestivirus out there. So there may be more, and they may be farther out on the genetic tree. So um, I tell you, say you can tell a microbiologist because they won't eat uh, rare steak, they wash their hands a lot, and they don't sleep well at night. Uh, there's, there are more pestiviruses out there, and we shouldn't be sleeping well at night. This is required slide by international law for all pestivirus talks, with just showing you the difference in culture between non-cytopathic and cytopathic. Once again, the non-cytopathic in nature is the more virulent of the two. Cytopathic, even though it causes cell damage, is less virulent, probably because it announces its uh, presence to the immune system and is more rapidly cleared than the non-cytopathic. 
This slide is also required, or some form of this slide, in all BVD talks talking about the persistently infected animal arising via infection in the first trimester of pregnancy, giving rise to the PI cap. We also have animals that are exposed after the first trimester of pregnancy uh, that are not PI. And then it's a third required slide, super infection of that PI with a cytopathic virus that may either arise in the animal itself or, or come from another, uh, another animal or from vaccination. But while this is a horrible way to die, this is not a loss leader for us. We have a lot more problems. We, uh, for a long time, we thought these animals were free and clear and born with antibodies, and they're just fine. These animals have lifelong deficits. If you look at their production values, they have problems with uh, fighting off respiratory disease. They have reproductive problems later in life. So these animals are damaged. Once again, BVD or bovine pestiviruses are never your friend, and they're never doing you a favor. All right, I'd like to talk a little bit about the impact of infections on the developing immune system. We don't talk a lot about this, but there's a relationship between the age of ruminants and susceptibility to infection. We've known that for a long time with other viruses too. And that indicates that there's a choreographed maturation process, that the, the neonatal immune system is maybe not set up to fight off some infections because it's still developing. Those cattle hit the ground with an immature uh, immune system. Now the thymus in neonates is largest and then is programmed to involute with age and that thymus is large at that point because it's programming the development of the rest of the immune system. And we know that stress and disease leads to early involution of that thymus but we really don't know the long-term effects of that. We just have observed it. What we also observe with BVD though, and this is a study we did where we waited 30 days post-infection with a higher virulence BVD. And these animals were age matched uh, at the beginning of the experiment. You can see the non-infected on the bottom, the infected on the top. They've had antibodies for at least two weeks now. They've fully recovered. But as you can see, there's quite a bit of difference between the animals that were exposed to BVD and the animals that weren't exposed to BVD as neonates. You can see that while the, these animals have started to put on weight, they're putting on, or these animals, uh, when they do start to put on weight, put it on as belly fat rather than in long muscle and bone growth. So we have somehow introduced, either by stressing the endocrine system or affecting the immune system, these animals are, are not going to be normal. Once again, this is a high virulent BVD. I don't know if this happens with low virulent BVDs. The studies really haven't been done to carry out for the duration of animals' lives infections uh, in the neonatal period. But if you're a calf raiser and you're getting these animals in and they have nice high titers to BVD, you're gonna say, well, they were vaccinated. It's not a BVD problem. It's either a genetics or a nutrition problem. It's a BVD problem. The BVD may be long gone, but the holes it's, it left, the animals are still suffering from. So the aftermath of ne neonatal infections on the thymus, uh, this is high virulence BVD. And this is, we did a thymus weight. We also made that as a percentage of the heart weight, so we are correcting for animal size. But you can see the decrease with a high virulence BVD, which may not be too surprising since high virulence BVD wipes animals out. But a typical virulence DBVD also results in a significant decrease in the size of that thymus. Now that thymus is there for a reason. You can't wipe out for more than half of it and not do something to that animal. So the reason I'm showing you this is that we teach veterinarians that BVD, for the most part, are subclinical. You'll have subclinical BVD, and it's only when it becomes a respiratory problem because it's set up a secondary pathogen or comes a reproductive problem that, that, that is causing problems for you in production. What I'm saying is we have, if we have this kind of damage, 
is this kind of damage silent? We also see that with the Hobie-like viruses, one of the reasons I'm showing you this slide is there seems to be a, high, a pretty good rate of variation among uh, calves on how much damage they're experiencing. So all pestiviruses given to neonates, this is what a normal thymus above the collarbone would look like. This is in exposed animals. So all of them, you know, no matter what calf you put them in, you're going to have some type of damage. But you can see some animals only get 20 to 30 percent decrease. Some animals will be up here at 60 to 70 percent. We don't know why, if they're age matched with the same uh, virus, why that's happening, except that it would be a host factor. So there may be genetic factors that make you more resistant to the type of damage posed by pestiviruses. Not only is that thymus smaller, that thymus, what is left, is not normal. This is, uh, this is using the Aperio system. So this, we do an H and E stain, and then we use an algorithm that gives you a color based on the density of the tissue there. So this is what normal tissue would look like. If we have red in there, that means we have normal cells. The yellow is more uh, connective type tissue. So that's normal, that's uh, BVD1A, typical virulence, BVD2A, typical virulence, Hobie-like virus, and a BVD uh, type 2 high virulence. So these pretty much subclinical disease, we're losing quite a bit of the thymus, and what we have left of the thymus is not in good shape. So that's even with atypical, not severe. Once you get into the severes, we're wiping that thymus out. Now, maybe the animal's able to compensate for loss of that thymus, but as I say, that thymus is there for a reason. If you're taking it out early, you're going to leave holes. So controlling bovine pestiviruses, your goal can be eradication or just limiting losses, depending on what your approach is going to be. The tools you have are detection, We've mainly been focusing on the persistently infected animal, which is definitely a need if you're going to go into eradication program is to eliminate those PIs. But detection, we also have to think about other sources of infection, such as uh, contaminated fetal bovine serum that's used in embryo transplants and in uh, vaccine development. The fetal bovine serum is a Unregulated, unregulated industry for the most part. They are self-regulating, and I'm not throwing rocks at them or saying they're bastards. What I'm saying is they may not realize some of the damage they do. We know that the best way to pass, to pass a virus is blood to blood. So if you're taking serum, it's a blood component, and any virus that is in there is going to replicate in your system if it grows in tissue culture. Now, you can say, well, I irradiated that, so it doesn't matter. Well, if irradiation is 99.999% effective, which would be pretty good, and we know that levels aren't that good, and you have a million viruses in there, which means you have 10 to 100 viruses left, you put that in a bioreactor, you soon have high contamination with BVD. So irradiation, while it helps, is not a cure, and we have to constantly be testing our reagents and our uh, biologics for that reason. Um, and I'm not the only one who's had this experience. I've uh, tested that, uh, fetal bovine uh, serum from companies, and it says on the bottle, BVD tested, and I found that it had live BVD in it, and I called them and told them, and they said, yeah, it said BVD tested, it didn't say BVD free. Buyer beware. And that was a major company. Uh, Vaccination is, of course, one of the tools that we have, and uh, talk a little bit more about that. And biosecurity, I won't have much time to talk about that. I think one of some of the other speakers will be talking about that. This is the one primarily uh, in my country is a big problem because everybody says they have a closed herd except for the equipment they lost lo loaned to their brother-in-law or the animals they sent out to the county fair and brought back or. Uh, the colostrum that they bought from another farm to feed uh, uh, calves. So there's a lot of things to biosecurity, and I think some of the other speakers will be covering that better than I can or will. So 
Let's talk a little bit about vaccines. So the question is, which BVD pathogen are you vaccinating against? We've got BVD1, we've got BVD2, and we've got Hobie-like viruses. And within those, we have multiple subgenotypes. So what are you going to use? And which clinical presentation are you trying to control? Controlling acute infections, uh, the, controlling the presentation of clinical signs for acute infection works very well with vaccination. Our vaccines work very well on that. For persistent infections, the vaccines work pretty well, but you have to remember if you're not getting rid of the persistently infected animal in the herd, uh, vaccines can only do so much with you. It's kind of like taking your brand new car and following a truck hauling gravel. You've got a nice windshield, but once in a while a rock will come off, and if you keep following that gravel truck, eventually you're gonna break your windshield. If you don't get rid of that PI, eventually you're gonna break your, the protection offered by your vaccine. It's not because the vaccines are bad, it's because you haven't given them a fair chance. And then which population are you trying to protect? Are you trying to protect the fetus from, protect, from infection? Are you trying to protect the neonate for its lifetime from infection? Are you just trying to cover breeding stock uh, so they are covered for that breeding period, or are you trying to cover feedlot stock who really just have to be covered for the amount of time they're in the feedlot? And so why do vaccine fail? In the United States, I have a little problem with producers because they want to throw rocks at the vaccine right away. And we do have good vaccines, mainly or quite frequently it's a management problem. You need time for the immune response to develop at least 10 to 14 days, and that's minimum. And that's when, if all your animals are in a position to respond to a vaccination. That is, we take a young calf, we wean it, we dehorn it, we castrate it, and then we vaccinate it all the same day, and then we wonder why we don't get 100% protection. We also have colostral antibodies in some of these animals. So, you have to allow the immune system a chance to respond. You have to give it time. You have to give it the phys physiological fuel to respond. Challenge occurs after duration of protection. Vaccines don't last forever. They de do need to be boosted. And the protection levels are not high enough. There's an animal to animal variation. There's a bell curve in every vaccination scenario. There's animals that are on the high end that develop a very good uh, protection, but there's always that trailing end of animals that for one reason or another, sometimes it's genetic, frequently it's management problems who are not in a position to respond to the vaccine. And then finally, we have antigenic variation between the vaccine and the field strain. So let's talk a little bit about antigenic variation. Uh, we know there is a genetic, genomic variation that, co that corresponds with that antigenic variation. So we, in the United States, we, because we have both BVD1 and BVD2, our vaccines have both BVD1 and BVD2 in them, principally because we uh, originally tripped over the BVD2s as vaccine escapes into well-vaccinated herds. But that's for my country. So the vaccine components be representative of the field strains, uh, which pestiviruses are circulating in the region that you're trying to establish your vaccination program, and are the antigenic differences between subgenotypes important? These are questions we have to ask ourselves. Uh, we talk a lot about globalization. And vaccine companies who are good people, who are trying to do good things, but do have to make a profit, would really like one vaccine that works for everybody. So they don't have to do individual uh, licensing over and over for each different type of vaccine. Unfortunately, while BVD is around the world, it's not the same BVD. And we have to ask ourselves the question, are we going to improve protection by looking at more of a regionalized approach to vaccination? So let's talk just a little bit first about cross protection against across species. I'm um, not gonna spend a lot of time here because I'm sure you've all seen something like this, 
but just uh, talking about killed and modified live, this is a uh, type one vaccine, experimental vaccine that was provided to us by Novartis. This isn't a commercial vaccine. What I asked them is, I just want a monovalent vaccine with just BVD in it, one species, just mock it up so we can see what the cross protection looks like. And they were kind enough to do that. When we looked at serial conversion, we'll just to simplify things. This is the results with killed. This is with the modified live. And these are heterologous. Uh, uh, protection based on serology. I didn't do the T cell work. This is just serology. And once again, it was heterologous, not homologous challenge. An homologous challenge really tells you a very, gives you very limited information. So anytime somebody's t giving you, this is how our, our, our uh, vaccine does on challenge, ask them if that was heterologous or homologous. But as you can see, the kills, uh, just don't seem to have the same um, breadth of protection as the modified live. And I'd also like to indicate, while there is some cross protection, the Hobies are not well protected against with our vaccines, our current vaccines. All right, let's talk a little bit about subgenotypes. In a paper that originally came out was by Pellerin in 1994. Uh, when he was looking at uh, the differences between type 1 and type 2, he no also noticed that the type 1s split themselves into two groups. Pellerin was working on viruses from North America. He's a, he was Canadian. Uh, subsequent to that, Dr. Vilcek looked at European isolates and got 11 different genetic groups. I think we're now up to named AB. BVD 1A, 1B on, I think now we're up to maybe BVD 1T. Some of those uh, may only have one isola, which makes it a little difficult. I think it's hard to have a subgenotype based on just one, one isolate. So I'm not sure how many subgenotypes there are among the type ones. There seems to be quite a few of them. The type twos have at least two, perhaps three, and the Hobies look like they're gonna have three or four. But if we look at subgenotypes uh, around the globe, we find that while we may have BVD1 throughout the world, we have different types of BVD1 throughout the world. And uh, this is kind of a summary of different papers out there, uh, combining a lot of different uh, studies, where I have an M that's, that indicates that uh, looks like it's the pre pre prevalent subgenotype within that country, based on the reports that I could find in the literature. The one that uh, is quite interesting to me now, based on what's been coming out, is that the Hobie likes might be, based on what's in the literature, might be the dominant uh, species. But as you can see, what I'm trying to show you here is these subgenotypes are just all over the place. So a rose is a rose is a rose, but a is a BVD1, a BVD1, a BVD1. What do all these subgenotypes mean, or is it? Uh, just the geneticists having a good time by themselves. So, impact of subgenotypes, the results from US studies. We know that BVD1B is the prevalent subgenotype in our country. Uh, for years, we were using a 1A vaccine, and we seem to have a drop in the number of 1A isolations that we're making. So, we do think it's the 1As work pretty good against the 1Bs, uh, 1As. The 1B rate has been the same over about the past 40 years. Um, antigenic differences, uh, we'll go over them in a bit. We have serological response to vaccination. We get different titers against different strains. We have vaccine escapes, uh, serological response to exposure, and BVD-1Bs, uh, persistently infected animals, can mount an immune response to a BVD-1A strain, uh, showing that the immunotolerance for the 1As does not cover the 1Bs. So I'm going to show you some very old data. And one of the great things about being a really old broad is sometimes you hang around long enough that your uh, results start making sense. When Steve Boleyn and I were working early on, we had the 1A vaccine. We, at that point, we didn't know that there was anything besides just BVD. We didn't know there were 1A, 
ones and twos or one A's and one B's and uh, went back and took a bunch of field strains and saw how well they were neutralized uh, using serum from animals that had been vaccinated with the current vaccines on the markets, which were a 1A. And we found that it divided them into two groups, and that's what we published, that there seems to be antigenic differences. Well, later on, I went back and I looked at those two groups, and it turns out those two groups were 1A and 1B. So the vaccine was working pretty well against the 1As and not quite so well against the 1Bs, dependent on the animal. There is animal to animal variation. These are just six different vaccinated animals. Uh, 1As in green, 1Bs in black. So there's antigenic variation that's recognized by vaccinated animals. Once again, this is B cell data, not T cell data. But I do believe it has some, some meaning here. If we just do classic cross neutralization, uh, we ha in the United States have 1A, 1B, uh, Australia has 1C. We worked on this project with uh, Dr. Kirkland out of Australia. He provided us with a number of 1Cs. We did uh, cross neutralization studies. And as you can see, I don't have Hobie on here. Uh, I have border disease as a, a different species out there. But as you can see, we have some good antigenic differences between those subgenotypes within the 1B. So are those differences meaningful? Well, we can get animals born persistently infected with 1B strains and herds can, uh, vaccinated with 1A. This is uh, work we did with Robert Fulton out of Oklahoma State University. And then uh, Robert also did a study where he took animals that were persistently infected with 1B and vaccinated them with the 1A strains and got very good uh, vaccine response. Well, and, and Veterinary medicine, we like to say, first do no harm. Well, of course, we always do harm, or we don't always, but we frequently do harm in the hope of a greater good. So an animal that's been dehorned or castrated might not tell you it really appreciated what you just did to it, but in the long run of things, it's better for everybody if those things are done. The same thing is with vaccination. Vaccination is, uh, hopefully a short-term harm for a long-term good. You're actually challenging that immune system. You're pissing off the immune system in the hopes of getting a response that will protect it from something worse down the road. So there's some costs of that. There's increased metabolic costs of uh, responding. Uh, there's indirect consequences of that upregulation. You may have some inflammation, some uh, just general nonspecific uh, angering of the immune system. And then because you're using energy to do that, you may have a dip in growth or reproduction. I think most dairy farmers are familiar with a post vaccinal drop in milk production. So what does this mean? Well, with an adult, you hope they recover and you hope you're not doing long-term damage for your long-term good. With neonates, it may be a little bit different in that once again, that neonate, you've got an immature immune system that hasn't set itself up completely. And so what I'm showing you here is if we use a modified live vaccine and a killed vaccine and a neonate, whoops, oops, oops, oops sorry, in a neonate. <clears throat> this is a negative control. These are animals given uh, a killed vaccine, a modified live. It's not as bad as an animal that was given a live BVD virus, but this is the ratio of cortex medulla. Remember I showed you that stain with the red and the orange? This is basically how much uh, orange you're seeing, how much damage you're seeing in those cells. So we're not wiping out the thymus with vaccination, but we're affecting the thymus with vaccination. Does this have long-term consequences? We don't know, but it is something to consider when you go into a vaccination program is how you're gonna treat neonates. So, and then I just wanna briefly talk a little bit about typical BVD. Remember, we've talked about fetal death, congenital defects, persistent infection, enteric disease, respiratory disease, but predominantly that immune suppression. But you have people say, well, I don't have BVD because it doesn't look like BVD. Or I can't have persistently infected animals because I don't have poor doing animals. This is a study that we did with uh, uh, 
South Dakota, actually South Dakota didn't really plan to do this study. They bought a, a, a lot, they were going to expand their beef herd and so they bought a lot of pregnant heifers. And one of those pregnant heifers brought BVD in to the final, as you go through this, they had 36 persistently infected animals born into their beef herd in South Dakota under controlled conditions. So it was a wonderful study for me, but not quite so happy for them. Uh, what I wanted to show you about this, there are a lot of things we found out in this study, but just to show you that 27% of those animals, of those 36 PIs that were born, looked perfectly normal, reached normal weights, and went to slaughter. So, and that was all with the same virus. This is how much variation you can get with virus, and the mucosal disease that took out some of them didn't bother others in that group with the same virus. So I don't think we can make assumptions that once you start having mucosal disease and that's walked through the herd, swiped out of the PIs, that's not necessarily true. And what a, almost one in three animals were fine. So we talk, you know, we always thought there's gotta be some, maybe it's virus to virus variation that gives you more healthy PIs. It's probably something to do with health, host factors. And there's probably a host factor that makes you more likely to survive a persistent infection. And these really are our typhoid Marys right here. And then when BVDV infections don't look like BVDV, uh, we had an outbreak in uh, feedlots in Texas in 2008. As you can see, I won't have to read all of that for you. We had extensive uh, lesions and uh, Quite a few animals uh, became ill. Morbidity was high, mortality was high. And these are the lesions we were seeing. Uh, you can, the uh, vet got pretty excited about w really trying to figure out what it was. Uh, our big hope in the United States is that we don't see foot and mouth disease. Uh, they couldn't, they eliminated everything else and decided to, to try BVD. And it turned out that those animals that were dying were not persistently infected with BVD, but this was an acute BVD uh, type 2 that was walking through that, those operations. And it looks like it spread from one group to another and took out quite a few animals. Uh, the next case I'd like to show you is late-term abortions and severe skeletal deformities. Um, this is what we typically think we see with BVD is early-term abortions and then congenital uh, defects in the animals that were born. What they saw in this one was uh, late-term abortions and severe uh, uh, malformations. We had animals born without four limbs, without jaws, without the back of the head. Uh, the veterinarian first on thought it had to be maybe a poisonous uh, forage that they were eating. It was only after working through a number of other things they decided to look at BVD and found out that it was BVD and this was a type 1 strain. So before when I was talking about uh, severity, this didn't seem to uh, cause any problems in the dams, but it was certainly more severe and a reproductive uh, pathogen than we have typically see with BVD. So that range of virulence isn't in, just in acute, it may be also be in reproductive disease. And then congenital tremor, which we commonly associate with Harry Shaker syndrome. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, I'm running out of time, uh, but we do see with BVD and it's related to hypomyelination that's directly affected with BVD uh, exposure in utero. And we don't know whether this is just within the first trimester or if this may be uh, also an effect in later trimesters. Okay, so you can't go out and smell BVD. You can't go out and look at it and say that's BVD. You can't go out and taste it and say that's BVD. There is no typical BVD presentation. The clinical signs range all over the place. There's, you can't really rely on the history uh, or post-mortem. The only thing you can rely on is diagnostic testing, and the only way to say that something is persistently infected is two tests at least two weeks apart. We've kind of forgotten that in the industry a little bit. Um, with that, I would like to acknowledge some really important people in my life. 
John Neal, who's been my partner in crime for the last quarter of a century, uh, Fernando Bauerman, who is a postdoc that worked with me out of uh, Brazil, who's done a lot of the Hobie-like virus, uh, Sholly Falkenberg, who was a postdoc for me, uh, went to work for a company, and now uh, she's come back from the dark side, back into research, and uh, will be my replacement come my retirement in December. And then I'd also uh, like to announce that we will be having the seventh uh, U.S. BBDV Symposium, uh, December 6th and 7th, immediately following the uh, CRAWDAD meeting in Chicago. I'd like to invite all of you to attend. If the, you can find more information at the CRAWDAD website. Thank you very much. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Julia. That was a, a, an excellent and very broad overview and catch-up of everything that's current in BBD. I, I'm, I'm afraid we're very, very tight for time. I, I, I can take one comment. I see some, there's some other big silverbacks in the world of, of BBD out there in, in the audience. Anybody, any comment or question? To want, one question for Julia. M Mike. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, just a, a mic will come to Mike. <laughs> uh, Mike McGann, Animal Health Ireland. Just on the back of your South Dakota observation on the PIs that didn't, that, that made it to, to slaughter, uh, it's just an observation on our Irish program. We've had difficulty encouraging farmers to get rid of PIs because some of them do exactly that. So just, it's just an observation when you get to the stage of hopefully moving towards eradication, convincing farmers to do the right thing can be difficult because the BVD behaves like that and then they tell us, oh no, you're wrong, we shouldn't be getting rid of PIs. It's just an observation and uh, backed up by, prompted by your South Dakota work. Uh, it's been our experience too and we also have those animals from the second and third trimester exposures who aren't very good looking animals and the producer saying that's the PI not this one, and we've actually had, I think a couple of years ago, the bull that won the Wisconsin uh, State Fair competition turned out to be PI. Okay, that's, that's all we have time for. I'm sure Julia will take any uh, comments or uh, engagements throughout the rest of the conference. So our, our